uh, Dedication Sunday, and all are encouraged to fill out the pledge form included in your bulletin, and which you may then bring forward later in our worship service. We'll talk more about that a little bit later in our worship service, but I wanted to give you all a heads up about it right now at the beginning of the service. Also, there is a small Christmas tree out in the foyer with tags for our Christmas family, a needy family that we are helping. You are welcome to visit the tree after worship, take a tag, and bring back a gift for the family. Help spread joy at Christmas. And finally, we are making plans for Christmas Eve services. And due to the pandemic, we'd like to have your help in deciding what to offer. One service or two, and do you intend to participate in person or virtually? Please let us know your preferences by filling out the small survey on the announcement page and dropping it into the offering plate during the dedication of our pledges. Thank you in advance. Now, this is a very, very important Sunday, not only because it is our Stewardship Pledge Sunday, but because of another thing. And I'm going to ask Ron to go ahead and make that announcement. Very important date. So, Pastor Jim, would you please stand and come out to the center? So 20 years ago on this Sunday was the installation of Pastor Jim Deal at this church. And I'm curious how many of you were here for that installation, a good number of you look at that. So normally, if it weren't for this darn COVID thing, we'd have a big celebration and a fellowship time afterwards with chocolate cake, of course. <laughs> but here we are, and in light of that, and we did give Jim a nice uh, vote of confidence last week when we approved his compensation package but I would propose that we give him another vote of confidence for 20 years of service for the standing ovation. That's right. Everybody's taking credit. Good for you. Um, okay, are there any other additional announcements? Okay, Gina. We have my sister Bill's daughter, Katie Cruiser, staying with us with her three girls for um, a, a while. They are moving from one place to another, and we get to, I, as I told everybody, I may not be a grandma, but I'm a great aunt. <laughs> <laughs> and I have my nieces, Liesel and Elka and Gretel, staying with us. And all my kids' toys are out, and they are loving playing with stuff. And so we're going to, we have family for a while staying with us. So, yay, say hi to them, wave at them after church. <laughs> yes, welcome. <clears throat> Glad you're here today. Any other announcements? Seeing none, then. Now please stand and bind your spirit as together we hum our <laughs> phrase. Did I say hum? Mm -hmm. uh, well, because we are prohibited from engaging in congregational singing. But there's no prohibition on standing and humming, so let us worship God through the song. And, yeah, okay.
in our hearts. We will enter his courts with praise. He has made us glad. His, his love endures forever. We join with all creation to sing a new song. Rejoice, O oh my soul. Again, our Savior, rejoice. Let us worship God together. Hallelujah and amen. You may be seated. So let's take a moment to pause and as we prepare ourselves for worship by counting our blessings and considering how thankful we are for those blessings. Even during this very strange and challenging year, let us enter into a moment for a Thanksgiving reflection. us to give thanks in all circumstances. Today we take that instruction to heart, to heart in hopes that in doing so we will do more readily, we will more readily express our gratitude this day, this Thanksgiving week, and indeed every day. We thank you, Holy God, for the gift of community in whatever way it comes to us, by blood or choice intention or accident, large or small, next door or around the globe. Through our worship this day, reveal to us the people you call us to love and be loved by, loved by all of us flawed, beautiful, and redeemed through grace. We pray this prayer in the name of your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now is when we would normally sing our songs of praise. However, these are not normal times. Yet I would invite you to hum along if you wish. Otherwise, enjoy our songs of praise, a special music. Thank you. 
self-induced separation from God. However, we understand sin. Let us offer to God what lies ahead in our hearts this day. Begin with silence. Let us pray together. Holy God, so often we take you for granted. We take for granted that you will answer our prayers, that you will heal us and make us whole. We take for granted that you love us. Forgive us for not appreciating your grace and presence in our lives. Help us to be more thankful. Give us faith to see you in everything and everyone around us, so that we may be truly grateful. In Christ's name we pray. Friends, so hear these words of blessing and assurance. I have good news to share with you. The love of God is beyond measure, and you are included in that love. Your sins are forgiven. Know that you are forgiven and thus freed to love and serve. Alleluia and amen. Please stand and body your spirit as we hum together. Great is thy faithfulness. <laughs> Thank you.
celebration. Oh Lord, on this Sunday before Thanksgiving, we pray that your light would pour over us and illumine these old, old words so that they would dance with newness in our hearts and minds in order that we would be radiant and reflecting your word in our living and serving one another, especially as we look forward to the Thanksgiving holiday. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Ron and Jeannie, for leading us in worship under certainly challenging circumstances as we can hum, but we are not allowed to sing. Um, and also, thank you for the recognition of uh, 20 years uh, serving this wonderful congregation. Hopefully, there will be many more years of us ministering together. Our scripture reading this morning comes from uh, Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. And, um, and then skipping over to chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. Listen now for God's word to you as I read. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. And skipping over to chapter 4, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving, at the same time, pray for us as well that God will open to us a door for the word, that we may declare the mystery of Christ, for which I am in prison, so that I may reveal it clearly as I should. Conduct yourselves wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this week we celebrate Thanksgiving. We remember a time when 399 years ago, when the first Thanksgiving celebration took place between the pilgrims and the Native Americans here in this new world. In the time since, Thanksgiving in this country has evolved into a major holiday for us, where in normal years, many people travel to see friends and family. Oftentimes, the day after Thanksgiving is probably the busiest travel day out of the entire year, in, in a normal year. We also enjoy special Thanksgiving dinners, um, usually a turkey, a stuffing, potatoes and gravy, cranberry sauce, pumpkin pie for dessert, and along with many other uh, special delicacies. Well, I have to admit, it's, it's kind of uh, dangerous for a pastor to talk about food during a sermon. Um, one farmer in a congregation I served explained why. He said, Pastor Jim, uh, sometimes you talk about food in your sermons, and when you do that, you make my mouth water and you make my stomach growl, and I have a hard time concentrating on anything else. While I do appreciate that, that farmer's point of view um, this morning, I, I want us to focus in on a particular kind of food, or rather a special kind of fruit. Not apples or cherries, I am talking about the fruit of the Spirit as found in Colossians chapter 3, although I'm also going to include a few selected verses from chapter 4, because they talk about thankfulness, and that seems especially applicable at this time of year, as Thanksgiving is on all of our minds. So today we're going to explore adding the fruit of the Spirit to our Thanksgiving meal in seven lessons, um, each of them centered around uh, one particular letter of the alphabet. I'm going to use these different letters of the alphabet to make the sermon points more memorable and also, frankly, because that's just the way my mind works. <laughs> so let's begin with chapter 3, verse 12. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. 
So here's our first lesson, and this is uh, centered around the, the letter C. Choose compassionate, Christ-like clothes. I, I love the analogy that Paul uses here to make his point. He compares putting on certain attitudes and adopting various personal attributes to the process of putting our clothes on each day. It's kind of like we can go to our closet and most of us have a variety of outfits uh, for which we can choose from. Everything from, from really casual, maybe even some uh, work clothes with holes in different parts and maybe paint splattered on them, to some of our better clothes. We might even have some clothes that we refer to as our church clothes, some of our best clothes. The point is, most of us have some choice about what kind of clothes we will put on. But this is no small point because there are many who believe that your attitude is controlled by your feelings over which you have no control. For such people, they, they do not believe they can control their attitude even any more than they can control, maybe say, the weather. And truth be told, that is a very common way uh, of looking at things. Uh, to illustrate that point, Gina and I have a joke that we sometimes use between the two of us to illustrate this point. And the joke goes this way, if I'm saying it. You know, sometimes I wake up grumpy. Other times, I let her sleep. <laughs> of course, when Gina tells the joke, she changes it to, sometimes I wake up grumpy, other times I let Jim sleep. <laughs> it's a funny joke, but it works because there is such a common assumption in our culture that your attitude is determined by your circumstances. And since you don't always have control over your circumstances, many people believe that you don't have control over your attitude. And, and many people, I think, go through life believing that uh, is, is to be true. Consider this statement. The year 2020 is really making a lot of people grumpy. How many people would agree with that statement? A lot of people. But the truth is that we are always in charge of our attitudes. And as followers of Christ, we choose to put on Christ-like attitudes in the same way that we put on clothes. So the first lesson is to choose Christ-like, compassionate clothes. We continue with verse 13. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And this is our second lesson, centered around the letter F. Instead of fault-finding, choose forbearance and forgiveness. You know, it's the nature of life that people will have different opinions and, and different ways of viewing the world, and sometimes people will rub one another wrong and take offense at one another. Paul is realistic here. He knows that life in, in the church, or in a family, or in a community, or even a nation, it's not all going to be peaches and cream and, and easy, an easy road. There are going to be times when there are real disagreements. Yet it is how we handle those disagreements which marks us as faithful followers of Christ. Our world encourages us to focus upon our complaints and the faults that we find in others. Now it's human nature to magnify the wrongs of someone else with whom we disagree, while oftentimes at the same time minimizing or maybe even turning a blind eye to our own. Yet here, Paul encourages us to be the first to forgive. Paul aims to make us a people who are marked by a forgiving spirit. It's so amazing how Paul doesn't specify the kind of complaint that we may have with someone. He doesn't say, um, if you have a minor complaint with someone, then exercise forgiveness. Because Paul doesn't want to do that because that would lead us to believe that if we, um, we had a major complaint with someone, we might not have to forgive them. And that's not true. And, and this is a big one. Paul doesn't say, if someone has a legitimate complaint against you, then you need to forgive them. As if we can hold on to unforgiveness 
if we are unjustly accused of something. Our world and our nation, not to mention our families and communities, I think we'd be a lot better off if there were less fault finding and more forgiveness. So lesson number two is less fault finding and more forbearance of one another's idiosyncrasies and forgiveness of their shortcomings and sins. We now move on to the next verse. Above all, close yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Our third lesson is centered around the uh, um, letter L. And that is, put on the long coat of love over everything else. And I have here my long coat that I can put on and it'll cover almost all of my clothes. And um, I particularly enjoy it when it's quite cold out, it keeps me quite warm. It, it covers on almost everything else I'm wearing. And, and even though that coat is quite long on me, Gina has one particular long coat that she purchased a few years ago when she spent hours out on the playground supervising children. It was so long it came all the way down to her ankles. And we joked that it was her sleeping bag coat. <laughs> Perhaps some of you have long coats. Well, here's this thing. In the same way that, that long coats cover everything we are wearing underneath, so the attitude of love should characterize and flavor every single action that we take and every attitude that we put on. Now, part of the reason why people outside the church sometimes have issues with us is that unlike our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we sometimes are a little short on love. So let us all wear the long coat of love over everything that we say and do. We continue with verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called to the one body. Our fourth lesson, centered around the letter P, is this one. Put peace in the primary place, which is your heart. The heart is seen as the center of a person's emotions. Really, the center of a person's being is where we find out what a person is made of, and here, Paul encourages us to put peace in that primary place in our hearts. Now, in contrast to peace, many people have hardened their hearts against others. That's what the, the term the scriptures use over and over again when it describes Pharaoh in the Old Testament. It says over and over again that in spite of, of plague after plague, Pharaoh hardened his heart against the Israelites. How many of us have hardened our heart against someone else? How many people have hardened their hearts against people they disagree with politically? I think far, far too many on both sides of the aisle. Our world, our media, and particularly extreme voices in our world they all encourage us to put angst and anger and resentment and resistance and sometimes even hatred into our hearts. But don't do it. I, I just want to say along with the Apostle Paul, just don't do it. Put peace in your heart. We follow the one who's called the Prince of Peace with all our hearts. So we need to be a people of peace. There's one more little phrase in verse 15, and I have not forgotten it, and here it is. And be thankful. So our fifth lesson, centered around, around the, letter, the uh, letter T, is this one. Try thankfulness till the end of time. I don't think it's a mistake at all that Paul talks about peace and thankfulness in the very same verse. Because one leads to the other both ways 
Peace leads to thankfulness, and thankfulness leads to peace. There may be a, why, a reason why in God's providence that those putting together our national calendar decided it would be wise to have our elections in early November, followed by a time of national thanksgiving later on in the month. Maybe they knew that elections sometimes lead to hurt feelings and raw emotions and unpeaceful hearts. And maybe they sensed that what was needed after a time of decision was to be more thankful for all of our blessings. Keeping up with our theme of thankfulness, I skipped over, I want to skip over to chapter 4, uh, of, and here's what it says in chapter 4, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. Prayer for the Christian is never to be an occasional thing or an afterthought, a once-in-a-blue-moon activity. No, we should be devoted to prayer. In the same way that some fans are devoted to football, their favorite sport, or so we should be devoted to prayer. And not only should we be devoted to it, but we should keep at it. Scripture uses the analogy of likening the practice of faith to keeping watch. Oftentimes when they would have a fortified city, they would have watchmen on the wall keeping an eye out for enemy day and night. And the danger is always that in the practice of faith, that we will fall asleep. In other words, we'll backslide in our faith and abandon it. And so here, Paul encourages people to be constantly devoted to prayers of thanksgiving, really until the very end of time. So rather than complaining about 2020, try prayers of thankfulness till the end of time. Paul continues with chapter 4, verse 3. At the same time, pray for us as well that God will open to us a door for the word that we may declare the mystery of Christ for which I am in prison so that I may reveal it clearly as I should. This verse is, is truly striking when, um, when you consider uh, the circumstances uh, that Paul was in. And it's particularly a, a uh, rebuttal of those who believe that our circumstances dictate our attitudes. I mean, here Paul is writing from a prison cell. But rather than throwing a, a pity party for himself and other prisoners, what Paul is most excited about and what he prays for is others. He is looking for opportunities to witness to people. He's looking for God to open windows of opportunity for him to share his faith in Christ with people who need to hear. So our sixth lesson is this one, the W lesson. Welcome windows to witness to the word. You know, if Paul believes that he can witness from a prison cell, we all cannot say that God never gives us windows to share about his love with other people. He certainly does. We may just not always be looking for them and take advantage of them. So look for opportunities. Windows which open in front of you to share about God's love. Because you never know where those conversations might lead. We end with verse 5, which I have purposely chosen because of all the events of this particular year of 2020. Conduct yourselves wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. So our seventh lesson centers on the, the letter M, and it's this one. Make the most of every moment. And here I think Paul may be speaking from painful personal experience. He's now in prison. There are some experts who believe that Paul never again saw the light of freedom. He was probably in prison for the rest of his life, or if he did get out, he was probably soon thereafter imprisoned in Rome. The point is that Paul may have realized, because of his confinement, how fleeting each moment of freedom truly was. You know, there's a seductive belief 
that we can always put off things until tomorrow. Many of us are procrastinators, putting things off until later, until it is crunch time and we're under the gun of a rapidly approaching deadline. But the truth is that life is lived much better when we make the most of each and every moment. So don't put off until tomorrow what you can do today. We need to make the most of every moment of each and every day. The present moment may not be the best moment. It certainly was not for Paul languishing in a prison cell. It may also not have been the best moment for those who originally heard Paul's word, the church at Colossae. And many of us would say that this has not been our best year. And yet, the word of God still encourages us to make the most of the time, even this time, in this year, 2020. This is a time with challenges, but when you think about it, almost every time has certain challenges. And it's still a time when we can make the most of the opportunities to grow closer to the Lord. To read the Bible a little more when we're confined to home. Or to spend additional minutes in prayer or on the phone focused in on our, the well-being of our friends and neighbors. So let us make the most of the time by serving God. Choosing to clothe ourselves with Christ-like compassion. Choosing forbearance and forgiveness rather than fault-finding and finger-pointing. Let us put on the long coat of love over everything else that we wear. Let us put the peace of Christ in that primary place, our hearts. Let us try thankfulness, not only at Thanksgiving this week, but really till the end of time. At the same, same time, let us look for opportunities to those windows that open in front of us to witness to the Word who is Christ himself while making the most of every moment of every day. And now, will you join me in a special Thanksgiving prayer, which is going to be printed up here on the screen. Let us pray. Bounteous God, you have lavished your finest gifts on each one of us. We thank you for the many ways in which you have blessed our lives with love, hope, friends, our church, and so many other things that we cherish. Help us be a blessing for others, that they may come to know you and rejoice in your love. Give us hearts of courage and confidence to step out into the world in service, bringing hope where there is doubt, peace where there is strife, love where there is discord. We pray this prayer in Jesus' holy name. ministry in 2021, as well as the reception of offerings. During this time, you are welcome to bring forward your stewardship pledge for 2021 and your offering for today. So friends, now hear your invitation, or invitation. Uh, the scriptures encourage us to give thanks to the Lord and to bless God's name. Even during this year and a strange time, we can do this. We can thank God for the bounty we have received, and we can return to God a portion of our blessing. We need only to be joyful in our thanksgiving. As you are able, please come forward to present your pledge for the coming year to the Lord as we dedicate ourselves and our gifts to the glory of God. Thank you. 
So bless us and our gifts for your purposes as we look towards the future. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 